This is a presentation on police questioning procedures uh, for people who are taken into the police station and who make admissions of commission of an offence or confession to the offence itself. So it's quite a big topic and there are lots of bits and pieces. I've tried to go through it as much as possible without getting uh, stuck in the in the small details and just to give you a general overview. So as with many other topics in criminal procedure at Deakin, the central question is whether the evidence obtained by the police is admissible and uh, just as with um, fingerprints and forensic procedure and identification evidence etc the central question is whether the police lawfully obtained the statements made to them by the suspect in custody so lawfully obtaining the evidential material whatever it may be and uh, the key here is compliance with standard police questioning procedures now before we get into all that there are general exceptions so the exception so general uh, procedures don't apply to an accused who's not in custody so someone who comes in voluntarily isn't under arrest that sort of thing there was a case that I'll get to of someone who is a witness a possible witness but later on in light of new evidence it was he was then charged so he went from being a witness or a person of interest to being the accused being a suspect um, if it's a summary offense then the procedural requirements do not apply and what we're going to look at in some detail is section 464H of the Crimes Act Victoria which gives some uh, directions on what would be called exceptional circumstances that justify the inclusion of admissions or a confession made during an interview uh, that did not follow police procedure and also if there are uh, many different or multiple interviews then if the prosecution is able to distinguish the, uh, the salient interview that is the interview in which the admissions were made from the other interviews then the procedural non-compliance of one interview does not taint the uh, the one that has all the goodies that has the 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 admissions the evidence of admissions that the police wish to uh, have passed on to the prosecution and which the prosecution wishes to adduce. So the first question is whether compliance with stipulated police questioning procedures is required and quite simply if we're talking about a suspect yes and the suspect would be someone who has been arrested or someone who becomes a suspect so someone who volu voluntarily comes in and then in light of evidence is charged and um, will later on go on to become a, an accused at trial. So in the case of, I believe it's pronounced Shitoshki, uh, they discovered new evidence. Um, the Shitoshki was a family member and uh, he was initially merely a person of interest, but uh, when new evidence was discovered, he was then, he then became a suspect. In the Volmer case, the cause of death was not initially known and so Volmer was not a suspect but once the cause of death was established through uh, f forensic evidence then uh, it be then it became a lot more plausible that Volmer himself might have been uh, might have committed the uh, the homicide and uh, he was he then became a suspect now compliance with stipulated questioning pretty uh, procedures, police questioning procedures is required when the uh, interview takes place in custody, so not out at large when the person isn't in custody and obviously it's relevant only to admissions or a confession, uh, otherwise it's not really terribly important. So the so once we establish the compliance with the stipulated police questioning procedures is required 
Then the next question of course is whether the recordings were made in compliance. So we're just going to run through the standard procedures and then also pay a bit of attention to the special procedures that apply to vulnerable suspects. And once we've done that, then we'll go on to this notion of problematic admissions, admissions that weren't, sorry, admissions that weren't made um, in the course of an interview that complies with all the procedures, etc. And then we'll look a little bit at the exceptions for these um, problematic admissions and then briefly look at what is meant by multiple interviews and their significance when it comes to uh, admitting evidence from one interview and disregarding the, uh, the, the influence of, of another interview on, on the important one. So let's uh, jump into the standard procedures. Now I'm not going to open up the map terribly much, I'm just going to run through the dot points because I'm trying to keep it as brief as possible, uh, but if you refer to the uh, slides then that will all be made clear. I've tried to refer as much as possible to the relevant sections and um, I'll fill in some more if, uh, if, it's, if I discover that I need to or if it's pointed out to me, so feel free to point it out to me. So let's start with standard procedures. Caution, reasonable period, privacy exceptions. So first of all the police have to caution the uh, suspect about his rights. So the right to remain silent, obviously, um, but then there's some, some key ones. Let's go on to the next one, the right to uh, communicate with a friend or a relative. So uh, section 464C subsection 1 stipulates that, a, that the police have to um, inform the suspect that he has the right to communicate with a friend or relative and pursuant to 464C subsection 2 they have to provide the facilities for communication i.e. Uh, telephone or, or some, some way of, of getting in touch with that person. But there are two exceptions to this right to communicate with a friend or relative and that is if the police have a reasonable suspicion or reasonable belief that this right to communicate with a friend or relative is going to be abused in order to fabricate or destroy evidence uh, or if it's a real emergency where they have a genuine belief that um, they have to extract information as quickly as possible from the suspect in the interest of public safety. So I guess what I don't have a case for it, but what comes to mind is if is the classic case of um, the police know that there's a bomb somewhere in the city and they've got some they've arrested someone and they need to get the information from that person as quickly as possible. Uh, but uh, if you come uh, if you come across any cases to which uh, 464C subsection 1 subsection D might apply, uh, do let me know. Uh, in addition to the right to communicate with a friend or relative, of course, is the right to communicate with a lawyer. And as and uh, to distinguish the right to privacy f uh, between the two, you have a right to communicate with a friend or relative and the police more or less have to get out of the room when you're talking to your friend or relative, but it's, um, but it's only with respect to the communication with a lawyer that you have an absolute right to privacy and where the p police officer's failure to give you absolute privacy is uh, going to get them into trouble. There's also a right to an interpreter if the person doesn't speak English uh, or if he is deaf or mute and the onus is on the police to ascertain whether the suspect requires an interpreter or not. So they, I suppose, um, as a matter of procedure, they'll just tell everyone that they, uh, that they can have an interpreter if they need, but obviously the key here is that the police are required to get a sense of whether you really understand what they're saying, be it um, and, and if you don't, uh, then they need to provide an interpreter. So as I said before, privacy for a lawyer or clerk only. And if the accused is a minor, then there must be a parent, guardian, <coughs> or independent third party uh, present as well. So if they've uh, arrested a teenager, 
they can't interview him uh, for the w with the view of of obtaining admissions or confession uh, if a parent or guardian or independent third party is not present. So assuming that they've complied with standard procedures, um, and in the case of, of someone of, of someone who falls within the range of normal, let's also bear in mind that there are, that special procedures apply to vulnerable suspects. Uh, now, vulnerable suspects come in three flavors: minor, a minor, um, someone with an intellectual disability, and Aboriginals, Aboriginals or Torres Strait Islanders. So the minors uh, have basically a right to certain certain uh, special treatment and I'm just going to bring that up so according to section 25 subsection 3 child charged with a criminal offense has the right to a procedure that takes account of his or her age so not very clear uh, but there are a few factors that would contribute to young person's disadvantage if the um, the, the the admissibility of an admission were to be uh, disputed in court. So first of all, vulnerability to pressure. Secondly, socialization to agree with adult authority figures. Thirdly, lack of verbal fluency. Fourthly, tendency to make false con confessions under expert or hostile questioning. And we um, can refer to the case of Tumal Tumalatai. He was the 16-year-old who was arrested in connection with um, a murder. And although the police didn't um, coerce him or resort to any kind of hostile or expert questioning that wasn't that wasn't in dispute, uh, it was held that he was vulnerable and that he really didn't know what was going on. Um, so that's that's youth. Also, according to the um, Children, Young People, and Families Act, Section three four six subsection two. They're only allowed to be detained, only allowed to be in custody for a maximum of 24 hours, and a guardian is required pursuant to Crimes Act Section 464E. If it's a person with intellectual disability, then considerations of fairness apply pursuant to the Crimes Act, and the Victorian Police Manual says st uh, stipulates that um, the uh, that someone who's in, who has an intellectual disability must have a friend, relative, or trained independent third person, um, and that the independent third person should be, must be allowed to speak with the suspect. And we would refer to the case of Worrell, where what happened was there an independent third person was provided, but basically wasn't allowed to speak and was just present. Worrell, I th if I recall correctly, was accused of uh, rape and he made uh, all sorts of admissions um, and the independent third person didn't intervene or prevent him or advise him that he should keep quiet or anything like that um, and it was held that this was not acceptable that he, he needed uh, some kind of advice before making all, all the admissions. Special rules apply to indigenous suspects in the Northern Territory there are the uh, I think it's pronounced Anunga rules and the Anunga rules are merely guidelines that were developed in the Northern Territory and uh, they um, are not binding uh, but I suppose they are worth referring to if the question is raised as to the vulnerability of the uh, um, indigenous suspect. So general guidelines, uh, there should be an interpreter if there is uh, if the suspect is not reasonably fluent in English, a prisoner's friend should be present, great care should be taken in giving the caution, care should be taken in formulating questions so that they do not suggest an answer, and uh, I think most importantly if a confession is made then the investigation should continue in order to obtain evidence from other sources. So in the eyes of the law indigenous suspects I think seem to fall somewhere between um, minors and people with an intellectual disability. They're not treated quite as someone with an intellectual disability might be treated. They're not treated quite as children, but uh, somewhere in between. So that's, uh, well, that's in the eyes of the law. That's obviously not a personal statement. Don't, don't hang me for 
making a politically incorrect statement. Anyway, um, so those are vulnerable suspects and these, uh, just to recap, the there are standard procedures with respect to giving cautions about rights, um, giving people a reasonable period to communicate with, uh, with, with interested parties, there's a basic right to privacy when they're communicating with their parties and uh, certain exceptions apply where the police have a reasonable belief that the um, that uh, the suspect is um, n uh, not going to play by the rules, shall we say? And if the um, if these procedures are not complied with, then there are uh, certain grounds for exclusion. Uh, if the if the non-compliance with the procedure gives rise to the uh, to the claim that the admission was involuntarily made, then it is mandatorily excluded. And this is a feature of all the of of all the um, uh, the interactions between the police and the uh, suspects, uh, giving rise to uh, state. Uh, uh, admissions or confessions. If there's a hint of involun uh, of the uh, statement of the admission being involuntarily made, then it's not going to be accepted. There are other grounds for exclusion, and they're basically unfairness, uh, public policy. Whoops, got to fix that up. Public policy, and also if it were if it was improperly or illegally obtained. So, improperly or illegally obtained simply means that they didn't uh, tick all the boxes, didn't cross all their T's and dot their I's for the most part, but sometimes um, if they, if the police really didn't do the right thing or really didn't follow their procedures, that will usually trigger uh, concerns of unfairness as well. And um, if they uh, have complete disregard for their procedures, then uh, that'll trigger public policy, but public policy is one is is an interesting ground for exclusion because it's a ground for exclusion where which only really seems to come into play when so many other things have been violated that it's 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 more of a non-starter. It's it's obvious that it's going to be excluded, and that's that's just yet another reason to to exclude the evidence. Now let's look at some problematic admissions. So most of the time what will happen is the police will invite uh, the suspect in or take the suspect into the police station. They'll run through the, the rigmarole, you have the right to remain silent, blah blah blah. They'll say we'd like to record this uh, interview. They'll turn on the tape recorder and then they'll have a conversation and in the course of the conversation uh, the accused, the, the suspect will make admissions or will confess to the crime at some point um, and there you have an admission and it's on tape and it's all good. But what happens when it doesn't quite work out that way? What happens if there is a recording against the suspect's wishes or without the suspect's knowledge? So in the case of if it's against the suspect's wishes uh, then it's there's going to be a strong argument for involuntariness and um, the chances are that it's going to be excluded. And I need to find some cases, uh, but um, that's a fairly straightforward. Now, an interesting case was the case of Carr in Western Australia, where where the suspect didn't actually make any admissions during the interview, but when he was um, uh, let out of the room, he was in another part of the police station. I think he was on his way out, or he was talking to someone, or perhaps he was on his way to the toilet. Basically he talked to someone, um, not during an interview, but he was caught on camera in the police station making statements that uh, were incriminating. And uh, the police, um, uh, of course, uh, were very pleased to have this, this incriminating, uh, these incriminating statements. And it was held that um, because he was at a police station, and um, uh, because he was at a police station, and he and he he basically he it, it was it's al almost a case of caveat emptor. 
um, it, it, it was held not to be unfair that a recording made at the police station, even though it wasn't um, in the interview room, was, uh, was okay. Now, let's say uh, it was not recorded. Let's say facilities were available, but were not used. So the general rule is that if the facilities are available, but they're not used, then um, the... I'll just, I'll just see if I've, I can open it. The general rule is if the facilities are not used at all, then the, there is uh, no excuse. If you have a tape recorder, you don't use the tape recorder, and you, um, as the police, then you've, you've missed the boat. That's, uh, that's pretty much it. But what happens if you have a tape recorder, you turn the tape recorder on, but it malfunct malfunctions during the recording? The, this was the case of uh, Dupas, and the, it was held that the police um, first-person hearsay, so the police uh, s um, uh, testifying that he made these admissions, uh, was accepted at the time. Now, if an admission is made before recording, um, that is, uh, then then it's it it's not accepted. If it's off the record, so the person uh, says no, I don't want to be recorded, then the police can can ask whether he is uh, uh, whether he accepts them taking notes. If they take notes and they write it up, uh, then he has to acknowledge the 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 write up as true. So it doesn't have to be taped per se. If there are facilities available to record and the suspect doesn't actually object to a recording and the police fail to make the recording and they don't take notes and they don't provide any kind of documentation as to uh, uh, as as to his admissions, then they can't do anything. But uh, if the suspect doesn't want to be on tape and is and accepts an interview where the pe where the police writes down what he says and then he acknowledges that uh, writing as true afterwards that c that is admissible. What about uh, admissions that are made after a recording uh, where there's an interview and then the interview is concluded but uh, the suspect then makes an admission after the interview is concluded well, in that case, it is held that the suspect was not actually under arrest anymore because the interview had been concluded and he was on his way out. Uh, that was the case of Kelly. So the procedures don't apply, and it's basically the suspect volunteering information. What about admissions made during the break? Well, if admissions are made during the break, the key here is that the police need to put the admissions to the suspect when they resume their interview. So they take a break, the suspect says, makes an admission, then when they turn the tape recorder back on, the police uh, have to say, ha have to put that admission to the suspect. They have to say, so tell us more about what you said during the break. During the break you said X, is this true, etc, etc. That was the outcome of the Nichols case. So if the police do not put the, an admission uh, that it was made during the break, when they return, then it's inadmissible, and that's what happened. Uh, what about admissions that are heard overheard during a break? Well, that's the uh, same thing. They need to put it either to the suspect or to the suspect's conversation partner. So in the Schaefer case, uh, Schaefer uh, telephoned, his, uh, telephoned a friend uh, during the break, made some statements uh, that were basically admissions. Uh, the police did not put those admissions either to Schaefer or to his conversation partner and their um, testimony was inadmissible afterwards. So those are that's just a quick run through of problematic admissions. Let's uh, and and just to just return here whoops sorry about that. So that's a quick run through of problematic admissions, and just to r run over the uh, grounds for it not being admitted, the relevant sections are 464B5H of the Crimes Act, 464G, 464H. 
generally inadmissible if it's one of those problematic scenarios. Uh, otherwise, um, inadmissible if recording facilities are available but not used, 464H1. If no recording facilities available must be recorded later, 464H1E. And admission made before recording is inadmissible, 464H1C. So if the if the, the police um, uh, have some warm-up questions to get the get the uh, suspect comfortable and he makes admissions then before they've turned on the tape recorder and then doesn't want to uh, affirm his admissions once the tape recorder's on there's not much they can do about it they have to either nab they have to have the they have to get the tape recorder on as quickly as possible that's that's the long and short of it there are some exceptions uh, for admitting non-taped evidence from police questioning. First of all, 464H subsection 2 basically says, of the Crimes Act basically says that uh, the there have to be exceptional circumstances that justify the reception of uh, non-recorded non -recorded, uh, admissions, non-taped evidence case of Dupas, uh, as I said before, Dupas made admissions while the tape recorder was on but it malfunctioned and then he refused to affirm his earlier statements and it was held that those were exceptional circumstances uh, and the testimony of the police was accepted. The Commonwealth Crimes Act uh, words it slightly differently and it says that uh, if the if the non-taped evidence from police questioning is not contrary to the interests of justice um, and taking into account the nature and reasons for non-compliance, the insufficiency of other evidence and so forth and special circumstances, it's basically a, a wordier way of saying exceptional circumstances that justify reception. So similar thing, if uh, the Commonwealth crime, if, uh, if the Dupas case had, per had pertained to a Commonwealth offence then the outcome would have probably been the same. The Evidence Act also uh, says, uh, Section 86, uh, that if we have an oral admission during a criminal procedure, so not civil procedure, but that's not relevant to us here, and the subject refuses to be taped, then off the record written notes may be taken, but those written notes may are only admissible if, uh, are admissible only if the suspect then acknowledges them as true. So so the suspect is well within his rights to say he doesn't want to be recorded. The police can then take notes, but uh, if he refuses to acknowledge the notes afterwards, there's not much that the police can do. Then. And, um, and that's pretty much it. So just to give a, a quick run through. The central question is whether the police lawfully obtained the statements made to them, the statements of admission or confession made to them by the suspect in custody. First question, of course, is whether the person really was a suspect, whether he'd been arrested or had become a suspect, whether he really was in custody, etc. Um, and uh, just make sure that we're not talking about a, about a volunteer. Um, and oh wait, there's sorry. There's one one other area. My mistake. Sorry, guys. Uh, finally, we're talking about multiple interviews. Ah, sorry. This this came problematic admissions that came loose. That's why. Okay, sorry. I'll jump back to multiple interviews. So, in some cases, there are you are you can you can have. If you have a, a lot of interviewing going on, like going on for many hours, it's not going to be one continuous interview because there will be breaks, and in some cases the interview will take place in different locations or sometimes over a period of a couple of days. The person will come in, come out, whatever. Um, the long and short of it is that if the prosecution can argue, uh, it's, so if if there's a procedural non-compliance in one interview, but the admission is made in an interview, in another interview, where procedural, uh, where there is procedural compliance, then the non-compliant interview does not uh, contaminate, to use the wording of the judgment in Pollard, Pollard, 
It does not contaminate the later videotaped interview. If it's one long interview, then the procedural non-compliance does apply all through, uh, and all the segments are part of one interview. And the Hetherington, Hetherington case uh, gives some guidance as to what the what is one long interview and what's um, many different interviews. Uh, by the way, in the Pollard case, they, he was interviewed in Frankston. They didn't give him, they didn't tell him about his right to remain silent in Frankston. He made all sorts of admissions um, there, but uh, the evidence from the Frankston from Frankston was not accepted. Uh, but after his interview at Frankston, he was then taken to the um, station in St Kilda, and there he made further admissions, and that was accepted. So um, the procedural non-compliance of the interview at the Frankston police station did not contaminate his later admissions in, in St Kilda. So to tell the difference between, um, to, to differentiate one long interview, which will be broken up by breaks, um, and to you know, that uh, toilet breaks, that sort of thing, and multiple interviews. There's no hard and fast rule, but four considerations follow. The proximity of time, the proximity of place, the relationship between the occasions, and the relationship between the interrogations. So if, um, if, if, it's, uh, if, if it's two interviews uh, following each other very, very shortly, obviously that counts as one interview. If it's at the same place, or if it's one room to another room, that's pretty much the same interview. If uh, he, if the suspect has been brought in for pretty much the same thing um, within a relatively brief period of time, and if the interrogation is really just, if, if from one interrogation to another they're talking about the same thing, then um, we can argue that it's going to be one long interview. And uh, finally, um, we can refer to the case, I think it's Fruknit, uh, to get a sense of what a reasonable period of time is, and that's just really taking into account the circumstances. So if it's a complex crime, if the police need to, do, need to go and search premises, search a car, speak to other people, get other people on the phone, then uh, even an interview that lasts many hours, I think in Fruknit it was five hours, uh, then that's a reasonable period of time. But remember that if we're talking about uh, vulnerable suspects, um, certain limits apply, like uh, two hours maximum, um, or 24 hours of custody for, for minors and, and all sorts of other limitations, depending on the jurisdiction and whether we're talking about a Victorian or federal crime. So uh, I hope that this has helped to clarify some of the key points about the uh, police questioning procedure. So, bear in, so just remember that we're talking about suspects in custody, not volunteers or, or other people of interest, that there are fairly obvious uh, standard procedures with uh, cautioning about uh, rights, uh, giving people reasonable periods to exercise those rights, um, certain rights to privacy, and there are exceptions to that. T uh, take note if uh, you're looking at a case of a minor, someone with an intellectual disability, or um, an indigenous Australian, uh, and also consider whether the admissions were made during the course of a of a of a procedurally compliant interview, or whether it was or whether the admission happened outside of those bounds before, after during breaks, whether the machinery was working, etc., etc., and, uh, and also whether we're talking about one interview that goes on for a long time or multiple interviews that are separated by uh, significant uh, relocation and, and other differentiating factors. And uh, finally, just consider these uh, three sections they'll probably be of the greatest interest, the Crimes Act 464H subsection 2, the Commonwealth Crimes Act, Act um, section 23V, and the Evidence Act section 86. So, thanks very much for listening to this presentation. I hope it's been helpful, 
and please let me know in the comments uh, where I might have gone wrong and if there's anything else that I should add to this map. So thanks for watching and uh, tune in next time for the next installment of Tabula Lex presentations on criminal procedure